Our very special guest joining us via Skype right now is David Humphrey from Kirkman Labs. And David, during the break, you were talking to me a little bit about when the light bulbs came on about autism. So tell the folks at home what you were saying to me. Well, you know, most of your audience understands that autism is not a hardwired genetic condition. Uh, however, when Stanford University did a study several years ago, uh, they ended up by saying that approximately as around 65% of autism is caused with toxicity and problems, environmental contaminants in the womb. And what happened then was uh, a guy called Dr. Peshoff uh, went ahead and took uh, blood spot samples of newborns that turned to be autistic and compared those to normal samples of children that didn't become autistic. And then with the great man, Phil Lundrigan, who is the leading environmental toxicologist in the country from Mount Sinai, they've actually listed the top 20 chemicals that are causing autism in the womb. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really a scary suspects. It's mercury, it's lead, it's organophosphates, and it's organochlorines. And by being able to understand how those pesticides affect neurological connections, we now have a, a really a requirement to bring this to people's attention. Yeah. And again, with a rate of one in 50, and really the rate for newborns is likely projected at one in 35 today, because these are eight year olds when they measured it last time. Mm -hmm. We have to start to, to, to bring this to people's attention and start to change this. Absolutely. I, I concur completely. And I, I mentioned before the break that when we came back, we were going to talk about a study that you've been involved with involving one-year-olds. So tell us about that study. Well, part of the program we have called P2I is preconception through infancy. Mm -hmm. So here's the question. Not, not everybody is going to start with preconception six months before pregnancy. Half the pregnancies are not planned. Mm -hmm. There are some people that won't even hear about the reduced toxicity. So they may have a child born that starts to show uh, signs of autism around two and a half, and then severe symptoms and regressive autism. So the question is, we got a group of scientists together uh, led by Margaret Bowman out of uh, the latter's program at Harvard, who I think is the best on the planet in terms of a, uh, of a competent researcher in this area. So the question was asked, can we find microgestures and biomarkers at the age of one that are very, very subtle signs? And can we demonstrate and prove that those are predictive of regressive autism? So the research team uh, studying the literature and studying the, uh, the programs that have been done found that researchers can look at blinded samples after they've been trained and, and they're able to estimate at a 50% accuracy that this child will become autistic. Okay. So remember now that we're starting to diagnose kids at the age of seven or eight. That's like leaving kids on the side of the road in an accident for 10 days, right? Mm -hmm. So if we can go ahead combining the preconception pregnancy to reduce the risks, but then with a the one-year-old, what happens if we can get 50%? The second part of the paper is that interventions can be very significant. A prominent researcher uh, did a pilot program that we took a look at, and that pilot program was they took 35 of these children that had high risk for autism. That means half of them would have developed regressive autism and maybe a lifetime of difficulty and struggle in their lives. Those 35 children were put through a program called the Early Denver Start Model, which is an ABA program. They also looked at their medical condition. Okay, this, this is absolutely incredible. What happened was for those 35 where the intervention was done and the intervention was ABA and medical, of the 35, 17 didn't develop regressive autism. None. 35 out of 35 did not develop autism. However, the average IQ was 127. And for you folks out there, that means you've got an A student rather than a C student or a yeah, B student. Yeah. And now here comes the fundamental question. Is autism, by being able to have those kinds of increases with proper training, is autism a regressive gene? Just like Temple Brandon says, mm -hmm. We're the people that build the bridges. We're the people that do the science. You folks are the ones that yak and yak around the campfire. So here's the danger. One of the reasons for so much genetic research is to locate 
the combination of genes in the womb to recommend abortions. And the tragedy that Dr. Rimland saw is rather than pursuing the science and rather than developing techniques to be able to uh, restrict the amount of, of problems that the child will have at two and a half by strengthening the middle cortex of the brain, uh, the other select solution is to abort the child. Yeah. Yeah. It was just crazy. It's, it's like sterilizing people in the 30s. In fact, there's a term for it. It used to be called eugenics. And this new movement is called new genics. And in China, a law was passed that all children that have serious genetic issues will be compulsively aborted. So what I want to do is I want to alert this community, you know, that we're on the verge of being able to go ahead and have a brand new view of autism, a view that will allow us to put a lot more resources into helping children and adults in the autism community and, and put the attention where we need it. Money going into helping people with the condition and then shutting off the spigot uh, so that new children will not need these same kind of services. So what I want to say is this is a central issue for our community because there's only a finite amount of money and we want that money going to teenagers and adults. My foundation is also starting to take a look at what are the medical protocols that should be for adults. I've had several close friends that have lost their children. The death rate for, for uh, adults with autism in the 20s and 30s by the Simons Foundation is 10 times higher than the normal population. It's from neglect. It's the same neglect that we had with medical conditions with children, we have with adults. So how are we going to get those resources to train the doctors and to get attention to this terrible problem of heart and seizure disorders with adults? We do this by being able to take the focus off the increase, slow down the rate of increase, and then focus on people with a condition and their families to provide necessary uh, services and to treat people with great respect. Uh, I think all of us are sick and tired of this community being poorly treated mm -hmm. by professional communities. Well, David, you're uh, inspirational to listen to, and I'm sure that our viewers as are, are watching, and so much information that you just gave us. I want to go back over a couple of different things. So the being able to test um, and see whether a one-year-old with a 50% accuracy may develop, is that something that people have access to? Uh, the study should be published. It was done with, we got 26 of the top researchers together. It's taken us two years. Mm -hmm. We we're on the final draft, so it should be published. We're looking forward to being published in pediatrics. At that time, we will have a checklist of the 10 warning signs that parents can use themselves on a one-year-old. And then we'll try to direct that toward uh, people that can go ahead and give a more accurate diagnosis. Okay. And then we'll develop uh, this very simple uh, technique uh, for intervention. Uh, this will take time yes. uh, you know, to develop. However, as long as we move in the right direction, we know where we're going, we can manage the expectations. But he here's what I feel is we can't wimp out on vision. What is the vision? Yeah. You know, yeah. medical accessible to everybody within driving distance, the latest technology available to all parents, and a focus on the government on serving the needs of existing people. So those are our focuses. And I think within three years, we'll try to institute the one-year-old program. In the meantime, we'll have a website trying to explain it once the paper is published. So it'll be a self-help for people, and we'll get that out of the autism community right away. Amazing, because I, you know, I got emotional when you were talking about it. When I think about what my life was like from the time that my child was one until he turned two and how I watched my child slowly disappear from me. I, I used to say, and I still say, that it was like a thief was coming in the night and taking pieces of my child. And I kept on saying, something's going, uh, something's lost. Something is uh, little by little. And it was so gradual that everybody thought that I was crazy. And if, if sometime down the road, if five years from now, an, another mom can be spared that and everything that came in the years after that, that's very emotional for me. I think about what my child would have been spared if we could have known that at a year and cut that all off at the pass. That is life changing. Well, you know, I think all of us in our lives understand that we have difficulty and make sacrifices. And when we do, the greatest calling is to be able to work 
so that others that we don't even know the names of don't have to go through the same experiences. Yes. And, and that is, to me, you asked me about Dr. Rimland. What Dr. Rimland taught me when I first met with him, he said, David, you will never meet a parent with a child with autism that you will not like. And I didn't quite understand that. I was an attorney and I was sort of a tough guy. And I mean, my life was not liking people, right? And uh, <laughs> I'm still going on trying to find the first parent I don't like. The sacrifice, the generosity, uh, the, the feeling of part of a community, it's my privilege. And, and I just thank each day that I can be part of this. Well, I am thankful that you are a part of this. I always say, you know, brighter minds than mine are working on this. And what a thrill to know that you're working on this and you are a brighter mind and you, sir, are a visionary. And I look forward to furthering this conversation with you on the show and hearing more about what happens. Now, if people have questions, uh, obviously they can go to the Kirkman Lab site and they can see the products that you have there and read more about the Kirkman story and your uh, level of uh, concern and, and your constant testing to make sure that people are getting pure supplements. They can read all about that on the Kirkman site, but is there a place that if they want more information about either of the studies that you talked about that they can go to? Well, the, uh, the Northwest Autism Foundation is the foundation I'm part of, so we'll be publishing a lot of information about P2I okay, and the okay. one-year-old study. It's the group that founded ATN, which is the big university group, so it's a very good group, and I've got an awful lot of very talented board members. So uh, that's that's really the central site, and I'll remember to post that on the, uh, the Kirkman Okay. The as well. Well, I thank you so much for everything that you do and for all of this information, which I'm I'm sure is going to make a lot of people very excited. Okay, and I have to go ahead and end this with what Bernie always told me, and that was treatment now. Yes. Treatment yes. now. Yes. Uh, words to live by.